Cool. Okay. So this is episode ten. Ten of ten? Uh, the Broker Banter podcast, and it is sponsored by Bupos. Roll the tape. Thanks, guys. Now we're going to talk about our episode sponsor. Bupos. So let's get into what Bupos does. So Bupos is an online business marketplace. If you are looking to buy an online business, take a look at Bupos. They have some great businesses listed. And on top of that, I actually quite like the analysis that they do on each listing. It makes it very easy to get through a lot of listings. As you can imagine, there are a lot of marketplaces out there. There are a lot of businesses for sale out there. But Bupos makes it easy to actually quickly analyze and see if I like this business or not. Another thing that Bupos does is on some of these listings, they actually provide some financing on some of these listings. So if you're interested in those finance deals or even the deals that don't have financing or just interested in Bupos in general, take a look at their marketplace and let's get back to the podcast. Welcome back. Thanks, George. Thanks, George, for the sponsorship plug. Um, so uh, I'm going to record my screen real quick and we're gonna take a look at some news that we saw from Digital Commerce 360, which um, yeah, so this came from Costco e-commerce sales grew 3x faster than total sales in Q2, which is like against the... Against the grain. Well, I mean, Costco, yeah. so Costco represents an interesting just general philosophy. I think like, let's go into bulk purchasing for a mm -hmm. moment. So remember over so much of like the D to C VC boom, how many people have you seen come to you and be like, George, we got like a subscription program to our to our e-commerce thing. But like, think about how many brands do you know that have actually like really successfully long-term implemented a subscription program? Like we looked at Dollar Shave Club a couple mm. episodes ago, but like for the most part, subscription e-commerce is like, it's just sort of being shoved into businesses. It's not yeah. actually driving any, it's not for the customers. It's that venture capitalists were trying to make D2C look as much like consumer SaaS as they possibly could. 100%. How to do that? Subscription. Even when subscription doesn't make sense, subscription. Yeah. Always subscription. Um, and it just, I don't think it long term has worked out. I think we've shown that consumers don't really like to subscribe to stuff. They like to get things for a great price. Yeah. So I've, I've personally been surprised that there haven't been more brands that lean into almost like the Costco effect of what does Costco do well? They ship you a larger amount when you're doing e-commerce like or when you're buying in a Costco yeah. location. The idea is to purchase in bulk. The average order value, the average mm -hmm. checkout at a Costco, I don't know exactly how much bigger it is than like an average grocery store, but it is bigger. That's yeah. their entire value proposition. I know that their e-commerce AOV is higher than other stores because they're encouraging when you're buying chicken, you're probably not yeah. buying $5 of the chicken, you're buying $20, $30. Yeah. When you're buying something frozen, you're buying a lot of it. Um, so I can appreciate that certainly as we enter a more perhaps recessionary environment, we know as a consumer trend right now, again, we're in August 2024, consumers are really looking to save money right yeah. now. Um, so I would be surprised if we don't see more brands start coming out under more of the Costco type model pushing. How would that work in ecom? How what would that look like? I think it's just larger volumes. Like, why not sell larger amounts of products at once if it's something that you're going to be potentially purchasing yeah. lots of? If you're coming out with, say, you come out, I don't know, like a sparkling water. And this is maybe a bad example because I don't personally like shipping water in my mm. e-commerce uh, endeavors, but. If you're, you're never going to make selling six packs of a sparkling drink or an energy yeah. drink or something work, but you definitely can make selling 48 packs yeah. work. Um, to me, that's just, the, I, I, I'd be surprised if we don't see more brands start leaning into that. And I think if you offer a large enough uh, array of product offerings, you can do what Costco has been doing, mm. which is charge a membership to be able to access yeah. those incredible prices. Yeah. So Costco obviously is way out ahead of that, but maybe you can start getting into niches that Costco is not in. Yeah. So think about different, there are tons of different niches where people would consume large volumes of things and need to, I don't know, maybe you can become the best at healthy frozen meals. I'm just making stuff up, yeah. but selling healthy frozen meals in bulk. You can do healthier stuff than is available at Costco, deliberately sell it in just enormous bulk. That's something with a long shelf life because it's frozen. Mm. Um, so 
that to me, that that's a really interesting potential play is offering consumers savings in a form factor that is actually the form factor that consumers are more interested in receiving in than a subscription. Most people yeah. don't like to subscribe to things. Yeah, it's very true. And for me, maybe the only part what, what, what that kind of spoke to me mainly was like fitness stuff. Like for me, when I lived in Mexico in the States and there were Costco's and yeah, I think it was Costco's, I would buy like 10 kilos worth of ground turkey because it's right. like the leanest with the most protein right. and just huge uh, containers of like egg whites. Right. And I would just heaps of yeah. egg white just smashed up and then beef mince. And I'm just like, I spent like $7. I'm like, this is lit. I'm fed for the week. There's I spent no money. Yeah. And even like protein powder, I'm buying it not in like a container or You're sachet. Like mega. In a massive fucking like yeah. cinder block worth of um, protein powder. I'm like, and the thing is you can kind of still do subscription though. You can subscribe every six months. It's like a rolling six month subscription. But you buy in huge quantities. I think you just have to look at: Do you get better conversion rates yeah. on the uh, on offering without subscription than you do on a like a marginal subscription LTV? So you just kind of have to A/B test your different mm. cohorts to understand: Like, is it actually better for me to sell six months yeah. of protein powder once? Because if you find your little George's Meathead Supplies <laughs> yeah. and you can buy your six months worth of like non unbranded protein powder and just buy absolute tons and tons and yeah. tons of it Massive. you'll be like that's my little that's my secret weapon that's where i can go get amazingly affordable protein powder and i can yeah. order i don't have to go to a store i don't have to lug it they're just going to deliver countless kilograms of protein powder directly to my door for an incredible price and i think you'll remember to go shop there yeah. in 10 in 6 months exactly. whereas if they were like you must subscribe to this like biannual uh, subscription, you'd be like, that's a little weird. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want that's to true. try to remember yeah. to subs to cancel my subscription if I don't want it anymore. This is kind of something that, I mean, you know, this model could work for this. I don't know if you've heard of you. I mean, now that I've moved to the UK, I see it everywhere. It's crazy yeah. because I remember um, Soylent, when it came out, I, I think it did okay in North America, but it didn't crush it. Like, it was, it didn't take over. Here in the UK, for some reason, Huel, it seems to be everywhere. There and are- Germany. In Germany. In Germany. Really Huel as well, really specifically cool. Huel as well in Germany. Yeah. Weird. It's just super popular there. It's countries not known for their culinary delicacies. No, well, the biggest food delivery, not food delivery, food planning delivery, what's it called? HelloFresh. Yeah. They're German. They're German. Yeah. And they've bought up tons of other um, yeah, yeah. of other companies. Um, but And it lends to meatheads, health, like real health nuts, but then it's just... HelloFresh does. It used I to. I, I, they used to be my rec rec recruiting uh, client of mine <laughs> um, in Australia, but uh, now every, it's just everyone. Like I'm talking back, back in the day, but yeah. now it's just everyone uses them. Well, there. Um but yeah, Huel is definitely is definitely more. They're crushing it. Yeah, they've uh, got their own um, vending machines. What? Yeah, I've seen them around town. It's it's absolutely bonkers. They've done really well for themselves. Oh, they got the toughest dude in. Oh, the UK. running guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Smart. Good for them. Yeah, they're they're absolutely killing the game. Good for Huel. Cool. Okay. Well, let's crack into some business reviews. Um, so this is one, an SBA pre-qualified Amazon FBA brand from Magnetic website closes. Collar stays. Now I immediately think this down. is dumb, like I usually do with fads, okay. but the utility and design patents in place, 18 years in business, so it's not a fad, 80% Amazon, 10% D2C, 10% wholesale, growing every year since 2021. That's not a massive flex, but mm -hmm. I'll take it. So to start off, let's talk numbers, asking price, 4.2 mil, cash flow, profit, 900K, revenue, 2.6 mil. And it is 18 it's been years old. for a while. Yeah. So it's been, it's just over a four times multiple. Mm -hmm. Getting my numbers right this time. Um, 
So maybe we'll have to get into, talk, talk to me about magnetic collar stays. I think the last time I wore a collared shirt was at my wedding. So a couple <laughs> years ago, it's not a, not a common wear for me. What's the benefit? Why would I wear a magnetic collar stay? Well, here's the thing. I don't know what it is. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 so keep yeah, your, yeah. So keep your collar yeah, yeah. shapely. I just don't understand why you need a magnetic one. Mate, I got no bloody clue. I, I still don't understand what it is. I assume it's a collar stay that is metal, but I just don't understand the benefit of it being... Magnetism. Of it, yeah. What do you get to do with a magnetic one? Man, I have no idea. Okay. Talk so about new niches, yeah, right? Yeah, what a niche. Stiffies. That's a good <laughs> brand name. That's gold. Droopy shirt, okay. Keeps your collar perfectly in place. Oh, is it so that they don't come out? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. They will allow you to place your collar in any position you like. Great, okay. We figured out why one might wear a magnetic collar stay. I don't want to listen to this that guy explain it. That is a pretty it. stiff. That's a st that guy's got a stiffy. Yeah, he's got a stiffy. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. So it you can you can you can shape your collar however you want. Um, I didn't know it was a problem. Talk. I mean, so many people talk about businesses failing because they're creating solutions for problems that don't exist, but. I guess there are enough collared shirt guys out yeah. there who really want to be able to shape their shape their stiffy. Who yeah. doesn't want to shape your it stiffy? It must be stiffy. Uh, we haven't received, we haven't signed an NDA for this, but it must be that. You think it is? Because it's the only branded. Well, we're in the UK right now, so. Yeah, actually, that's that true. might be why. Um, but they do say they've got this this patent on it, so yeah. who knows? Um, if it's not stiffy, yeah, and they've got a utility patent on it. Well, it's SPF to... pre-qualified, so it must be US. So it's US based, and Stiffy's was a, a UK business. So right away, I'm like, do they have a utility patent that they're not enforcing? Mm. If you haven't been enforcing a utility patent, there's actually, then anyone can start violating it and say, hey, you haven't defended yeah. your patent previously. So we're actually allowed to get around your patent because you haven't been defending it. I never knew so much about patents before you told, started telling me so much about them. Oh, I'm kind of like, morbidly fascinated by them yeah. because people think people I remember when I started getting into business people would talk about patents like they were a shield like yeah. oh if you like patent black a white. product yeah then no one else can do it mm. and over time I've learned they're a sword and they're mm. a really expensive sword so you can file your patent you can get a PCT you can do your Paris Convention Treaty and file in all sorts of countries and um, I think we've talked about PCTs before but that's where you like say you file in the US your patent your utility patent, and then you file a PCT. Uh, if you get your PCT and your US utility patent, then you can file in all sorts of countries internationally um, using your original US patent, so you don't have to pay for translation and mm -hmm. it's cheaper filing costs in each country. But you still have to pay for per country. What will that cost charge you? Uh, it depends on your law firm, but yeah. I, think, I think minimum nowadays you're looking somewhere between 500 to 1,000 per country. Likely it's going to be yeah. more in some of them. And then there's annual maintenance fees. Yeah. So every country that you file in, you're actually like subscribing to a fair amount of overhead. And that's just to maintain the patent. If yeah. someone actually violates it, you do have to go out and pursue them. You have to show, be able to show that you've pursued them. Because if yeah. you don't, then people can say, okay, you're not defending this patent, so we can go out and if you're not defending it, then you know it's open season. Well, I see, I, I learned a bit about this space just from EasyJet. So I met the owner of EasyJet, uh, well, founder of EasyJet, Sergio Salzuano, because he's Greek. And his business now, he doesn't, sorry, he doesn't own EasyJet. Yeah. He started it, but he owns Easy, the brand. Right. He owns the color and yeah. the yeah. lowercase yeah, the Easy. Orange. And so 4% of, so the EasyJet pays him 4% of revenue. And all that the Easy seems brands, like a lot. Yeah. Of revenue? Yeah. Okay. And um, I'm pretty sure. Let me check. Easy brand, 4%. Maybe. Easy.com. And so the easy hotel, easy ferry, easy everything, just pay them that on top. <laughs> um, Stelios. Cool. And... Uh, 
Yeah, all, all he does is just collect that. And he's make, he makes stupid money doing that. Um, but he, all he, like these are all the easy brands. Easy right. Hemp. And he doesn't, he doesn't operate any of these. None. None. He operates this. It's just if you want to be easy, yeah. you got to call Stelios. Yeah. So, uh, and then he just spends it on his philanthropic stuff. He wants to, you know, run out of money by the time he dies. Like the giving pledge with Bill Gates. Yeah. And he's got five bills to burn through, so. <laughs> um, Poor guy. Yeah. Is it, are we in Kensington? Is that close? We're not far from Kensington. Um, but, I mean, he does. He's very active in defending that patent. Well, uh, trademark, sorry. That's like a 20-minute walk. Oh, nice. Hey, he doesn't live here. He lives in Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. No, patents. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, a 23 repeat order rate. Not bad. For, I mean, they might damage over time. Mm, getting more shirts, more you'll lose shirts, them. Yeah. But I guess it doesn't make sense if you're losing them. Why? Okay, so they've got an AOV of forty four sixteen. What's interesting to me here, AOV of twenty five seventy four on Amazon. So they're probably selling more units, mm. obviously per order on Shopify. Um, the average customer is a male professional, makes over a hundred. So it's kind of yeah, a, it's a banker bro. It's a banker. Mm, sorry, any banker bro. bros listening to this. Um, but uh, that it sort of makes sense to me. But the AOV being that low, in my experience, that's not quite a high enough Shopify mm. AOV for me to feel comfortable running ads. Or 80. Like I get kind of excited around like 120 AOV, really? but that's just that's like I have a very particular kind of set of that's why way that I raises are so expensive. You want that high? Those raises cost a lot to manufacture. Yeah. Um. So, like, but that's where I get more comfortable because the higher your AOV. Ultimately, like if you're if you're working on the target gross margin that I yeah. operate on, then it gives me more room to acquire a customer with. Like this, that's just not a lot of margin room to go out and run mm -hmm. ads on. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying like you you've got a lot less kind of margin of error, so to speak. Um, if they genuinely have no competitors because they're they own and defend a utility patent, great. But I don't know how much utility patent defense you're getting away with. What, what was the, I mean, it's not that big a space. It's not a, it's not a huge business. If they're number one, which they claim to be. I've been around for 20 years. I don't know, I, good for the, ultimately I'd say good for them. I like a business that looks like this for employees. It's been around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I'd want to see like how stable is this? Like how good a job are they doing defending the patents? But you know me, I love a crazy deep e-commerce mm. niche. Go way, way, way deep down. They're probably getting quite a lot of organic sales yeah. at this point, right? Because you've just been around for that long. I also think you know. Let's say you so you buy this business. The type of people who are coming in, people with money, yep, from the West with yep. bloody good jobs, who care about their suit so much. They want their collar to be perfect. They want to shape their collar. They want this collar like yeah. that. Yeah. And they that want means to be able you can to also sell them it... ties, which yep. are cheap, tie clips, yep. uh, cufflinks, uh, sock holders, like all sure. these, uh, yes, uh, what are they, like garters or whatever they're called to hold them. Like all these small things that are easy to ship. Yeah. Probably pretty damn cheap to make. Yeah, they've probably got a pretty good customer list. Yeah. So you'd have to look at like what else are they selling? Is there. Uh, that's a great point. Like you could do some product expansion. That's what I love for these sorts of businesses. They've been around for a long time. If you get something like this, um, I know so, like there's another brand in the the shaving niche that they sold to private equity a year or two ago, and I was like, I'm curious what they're going to end up doing with it. But I admire what they've done. Um, I won't name the business, but they've massively expanded their product innovation like way mm. faster than any other company I've seen in like the classic shaving niche. Um, I have no idea if it's performing really well for them, but typically what I've seen when that happens, like that level of rapid product innovation yeah. does typically result in expanding your customer base and you're just getting longer LTVs out of your existing customer mm. base. So if you have the ability to kind of tack on the, all the products you just listed, you could private label every single one of those yeah. things. Like that's not, 100%. by product innovation, I mean literally just release new products, purchase the inventory, maybe even drop ship the inventory. Um, but 20 years, I imagine that this business, assuming that these numbers have been looking like that for a while, mm. they've got a pretty healthy, 
pretty healthy customer base, yeah. I'd imagine. Um, this is a great business. I like this business. I don't, I don't mind the valuation. I think it's a reasonable, clearly on, on Amazon. Um, I don't mind this. They've been, they've expanded, countries now sell in, yeah. This business, frankly, like the, it, it looks, the profile looks a lot like, uh, look like my shaving business. So, I mean, I'm a fan. Beautiful. I like that listing. Um, let's look at one more, then we'll wrap it up. So we've yeah. got the actual name of the business. Yeah, okay. so we can't show you this one because it's confidential. But, uh, oh, because we're logged in. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so this is a flipper listing. 10 years in business, they want 10 mil. That's obviously why I wanted us to take a look at it to probably shit on the valuation. Okay. So, with strong IP and partnerships, so they're Classic. doing uh, four point, they're doing uh, 4.7 mil rev, 1.7 mil profit. I don't know if I believe that number. Not bad. Uh, Domain authority, they claim to be selling on Shopify, Etsy, Amazon, Walmart. Let's see some of their details here. Yeah, but they're saying their Shopify only represents 7% of their total sales. They've been around since 2013. They're doing a lot of, so, so they're, they're across a lot of platforms. They say they're on like Best Buy and Staples, all sorts of places. So they, they've adjusted their EBITDA way up. So there's, there's a ton of adjustments. In, in 2022. Those. Okay, yeah. So, so does that mean perfect. they don't even have finished financials for 2023? I assume that's maybe they may be saying that to indicate. Oh, they're, what they they're, best, they're a Best Buy dropshipping business. Okay. Eighty percent of the revenue from Best Buy. Which is scary. Yeah, that's that's a really high reliance on like yeah. a tertiary marketplace. Yeah. So but good for them. Like that yeah. that requires a lot of relationship management. I just don't know if I want to buy that kind of relationship risk. Yeah. Certainly not at over six times multiple and i mean they said that ip and so i don't know any um businesses in the mobile accessory space running at an actual 36 percent net margin that doesn't mean that they're not but all i'm saying is i've seen many of them yeah having cmo'd a mobile accessories business at one point uh Oh, yeah. That is a lot. Yeah, I did that while I was doing Lomi. That was crazy. These aren't special cases. No, I think they've just got a relationship with Best Buy, which from what I know about Best Buy, that can get turned off any minute. And we've talked about mobile accessories before. All of these need uh, molds. You need to invest mm. in the molds. For How many SKUs this thing has in color? 176 products. And that's I don't know, it's just overall, like if you're thinking about getting into this space, like, it's a brutal, it's a brutal space. I mean, my friend owns the number one phone case business in um, Greece. I forget what it's called, to be honest. Um, and he's doing like three, four hundred K a year profit. Profit. Yeah. Um, let me try and find if I can find this guy. But that's the thing, like. Of all the niches, I think, for e I think I hate mobile accessories the most. It's just really, like, it requires a tremendous amount of overall, like, design management, mold management. Like, it just, it takes a lot. Is this him? Yeah. He, I think he does a few of his own designs. But look, I mean, going back to what we said maybe bloody five episodes ago, like, Niching down. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he does some more Greek unique designs for Greece. Not that that's anything special. Sell him for very cheap. Yeah, very Greek in Greek. If you're the number one bloody phone, iPhone case in seller any country. in Greece, mm -hmm. yeah. which is not very e commerce friendly, um, you can make three to 400K net profit. Sure. That's insanely good. That's a life. It's just if if you could choose between getting into that space or going on exploding topics and figuring out something yeah. like trending, like this is just it's the reddest of red oceans. Yeah. Um, and if you're successful, it just and you have to get into more and more molds. You have to support more and more SKUs, more and more phones. There's always new phones coming out. 
you got to try to figure out how to get access to the the measurements for upcoming mm. iPhone and Android phones before they get released, which involves doing some sketchy stuff. So I don't know. It's just it's a space that I'm not I'm not particularly interested in ever touching ever. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, we'll knock one last one off. He's a listing from Acquisitions Direct, SBA pre-qualified commercial door hardware online brand, 20 years in business, retail of commercial doors. Sunder sold under their own brand, 475 SKUs, 96% of what is uh, Amazon, AOV of 100. Okay, we got doors. Amazon doors. <laughs> Great. Um, 20, wait, what are we saying here? Oh, I see, trailing 12 months in year to date. I was confused, but the Maybe breakdown there. Like that. Weird. Um, so full last, full year of revenue I have is 2023, of course, and they're doing like 11 million, and they put 2 million-ish on the bottom line, so, you know, it's pretty good profit margin for, for doors. <laughs> Um, 20 years in business. 20 years in business, 11 specialty manufacturers. Um, so Can't be that special, they're making doors. Yeah, I mean, you never know. You know that being said, I sold a hardware a furniture business and the suppliers were the Amish. Yeah, I've heard of, there's a number of people who yeah. get into like the, the Amish, uh, Amish furniture game. It's a good, I've heard some people do pretty well in that space. The owner is retiring, this business is 20 years old. Can be operated anywhere. I look, I, furniture and general home drop shipping stuff is, it's, it's certainly, it's a, it's a real space. People do pretty well for themselves in that space. It looks like at least the last two years, revenue and profit grew linearly. Um, you'd want to dig into Loading. it more, but I, I want to understand like where are they. Um, so they're not drop shipping because they're holding $1.4 million worth of inventory. That's different from most of the folks that I know in the, the yeah. furniture space, like cabinetry and anything like that, almost all of them drop ship because there's less sensitivity in that space around when you're ordering a door, you're not like, I need that door It'll tomorrow. It'll come where it comes. You're like, I need to close this. <laughs> yeah, like when you're buying, I don't know, stuff on laundry detergent, you're probably yeah. buying laundry detergent on Amazon because you need laundry detergent because yeah. you just ran out and you're like, oh shoot, yeah. I need laundry detergent. Doors. You usually have so. a door already. Yeah. Usually, I just most change people have tomorrow. doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually you can operate, but they've chosen to go not that model. Um, that means they're probably keeping a little bit better margin, um, which makes sense when you're going after an AOV of $100. I don't know all the things. I'm not a door scientist, but that seems like a cheap door. That is a cheap, maybe it's like a... That's their specialty door. It's a specialty door, but maybe it's not like a wood door. Yeah. Maybe it's like... Like a folding sliding door? No I clue. Don't, I don't know that much about doors spe no specifically. But they're requiring a lot of customers. Think about like an AOV of a hundred bucks. And if you're doing 11 million in revenue in 2023, whatever door this is, whatever specialty door we're looking at, mm. this is a, they're doing major growth opportunities. First, okay. don't believe you. We're talking about doors. It seems pretty established and commoditized. Yeah. They want to expand the e-commerce store and they want to grow on Home Depot, Wayfair, Walmart, and other. So it's sort of the classic pitch that we see on any of these home goods type businesses, right? They're saying, hey, you can expand by doing a better job on all the classic marketplaces. Mm. Um, I don't know. Like overall, the, the, the highest level numbers check out. If I'm seeing this listing, I'm probably at least asking about you know, next steps on due diligence. I think it's just under a four times multiple. So at least, at least it's kind of in the realm of reasonability. You've got seven employees. You've been in business for 20 years. That possibly makes sense, especially if they got 500 SKUs, like 11 manufacturers. You're doing some pretty meaningful kind of vendor management at that point. You gotta be thinking about that. Um, you got a big brand on Amazon. Like, yeah, you're 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 managing you're managing a lot of different stuff. So I, I can kind of make sense of this. I would definitely this this uh, justifies doing a little bit more diligence. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't write this one off just like at first glance. Um, so I think they've priced it well. Uh, just again at first glance. Um, 
but that is a that is a tremendous amount of inventory. I wonder if the owner is partly retiring because the owner has yeah. ordered too much inventory. I'd be paying that on consignment, best case mm -hmm. scenario. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good idea. Cool. All right. Well, uh, this is the last session for today. That is the end of episode 10. 10. We'll call that episodes. season one. That's season one. We'll call that yes, season fair, one. Yeah. We're doing a good job. 10 yeah. episodes. Um, yeah. Another great thank you to Bupos for sponsoring this uh, episode you, and the last few episodes. And we will see you in the next episode.